So if you've clicked on this video, I'm gonna take a wild stab in the dark and say that you might be someone who maybe is having trouble like remembering tasks, staying focused, finding a routine that works for you that you actually like do every day. If that is the case, then you'll probably wanna stick around to the end of this video where I'll be talking a little bit more about today's sponsor, Fabulous, an app that helps you with setting like daily routines as well as longer term self-care goals with behavioral science at its core. And because obviously I'm gonna give you the hookup, the first 100 people to click the link in the description will get 25% off a premium fabulous subscription. So hi, hello to everyone who is new to this channel. My name is Rowan. Everyone who isn't new, hello, welcome back. Um, this is obviously a very different video to what I normally make. I'm normally doing very scripted, like video essays, media criticism, stuff like that. Uh, but I really felt like this experience that I've just had, getting diagnosed with ADHD at the age of 29 as an adult, seems to be something that a lot of people on the internet are currently going through or thinking about. And so I thought it might be useful to have a video like this going through the entire process from when I first started to think that I might have ADHD all the way through to like now that I have like had the assessment, I've had the diagnosis, I'm on medication. And hopefully it might be like useful or relatable or interesting to people who are going on that same potential journey. So I've tried to split this video up into very ADHD friendly like sections. So it's not just me rambling forever. We are going to be going through uh, what is ADHD? Why did I first think that I might have it, how I went about getting a diagnosis and what happened at the actual assessment where I was being diagnosed, uh, what has happened since in terms of like how has medication been, stuff like that, some tips and tricks and ideas and things that have worked for me to try and help with ADHD. And finally, do I regret getting the diagnosis? Like, was it the right decision for me? And um, basically all of the different topics and questions that people on my social media and Patreon asked when I said that I might be doing a video like this. I do need to do a very quick disclaimer at the beginning. I am obviously not a medical professional. Uh, this is not medical advice for anyone. Um, and also I live in the UK. So I, my process was dealing with like the NHS and the healthcare system over here. So it may well be different where you are. So part one, quickly, what is ADHD? I imagine if you clicked on this video, you might have some ideas, but I thought I would just get some, lay some groundwork so we all know what we're talking about. So the extremely dry NHS definition, um, cause we love to start with like a, a dictionary style definition, uh, is just, Attention deficit hyperactivity disorder is a condition that affects people's behavior. So that doesn't really tell us anything. Um, so what we need to do is look at like the symptoms or the ways in which this might express itself in people. I think that makes a lot more sense. So there are kind of two types of ADHD. One is the inattentive type and then the other is the hyperactive or impulsive type. And then you can also have a third type which is combined, which is what I ended up getting diagnosed with. And various websites will have different kind of like examples of symptoms of each of these different types, because obviously there are so many ways in which it can manifest itself. So some examples Examples for inattentive ADHD that I found, easily distracted, forgetful, even in daily activities, unable to give close attention to details, doesn't follow instructions, fails to finish schoolwork or chores, has trouble with organization. I think it's pretty telling that they talk about schoolwork or chores because uh, this list and a lot of lists very much focus on the types of symptoms you might get as a child. The idea is that it comes on in childhood and then you still have it as an adult, but it's not something that will just like appear when you are an adult. So it's interesting that a lot of these symptom lists are like very specific to school um, or to being a kid, which as we will find out later, can be quite difficult when you're trying to get a diagnosis as an adult. And then the hyperactive type has symptoms like appears to be always on the go, talks excessively, severe difficulty waiting their turn, squirms in their seat or fidgets, blurts out an answer in class before someone finishes asking the question. So a lot of these sites basically will like say explicitly there is a real lack of research done on like adults with ADHD, especially because it might well manifest like very differently with the different kinds of like stresses and pressures and experiences and sense of independence that you have as an adult. So things like um, hyperfocus, uh, negative self-image and fatigue have all kind of been linked with ADHD, but but it's one of those things where it's very anecdotal and it's difficult to say with like scientific certainty, but a lot of people do seem to experience it. So section two, how did I figure it out? How did I start to work out that I had ADHD and why did it take me so long? So I was not diagnosed as a child, evidently. Um, there was not even a whisper of it, to be honest. I think that at the time, ADHD was very much viewed as like a, a small, probably white, boy running around a classroom, screaming, jumping on tables. That was the like stereotypical image of ADHD. And like you, you sort of were gonna be somewhere around that image if, if you were going to be diagnosed, like that's what it looked like. And that very much wasn't me. I was like 
a good student. I went to a very academic school. I got like a scholarship at 11 plus. I got straight A stars in my GCSEs apart from biology. Uh, still bitter about it. And what that obviously meant was there was no like red flags that were being thrown up. Hey, maybe something's going on with this girl. But this didn't come out of nowhere when I was an adult. Like as I mentioned previously, the idea with ADHD is that you will have had it your entire life. Like you will have been displaying symptoms in childhood. It's just what those symptoms were and how they manifested. So there are a few things in school that stuck out as potential problems. Um, we're gonna get to our first list of this video now. They kind of stopped before they became what I think people consider like real problems that you needed to go to the doctor for, or there was always some kind of like caveat or balance that was kind of seen as an excuse to, to balance it out. So one, if I was not under supervision, I would get distracted to an extreme degree. It was like a running joke at school that I was consistently always without fail the last person to get changed for gym because obviously those locker rooms did not have adult supervision and so there wasn't like a teacher being like hey remember you're meant to be changing let's change for gym let's go 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 so I just didn't but on the other hand when I was in class with a teacher and being supervised I wasn't one of the kids who was super distracting I was like trying to concentrate and number two I talk a lot incessantly very fast this was something that I don't think I was aware that I did as a child until I was in the car. You can tell that this is like mentally scarred me because I remember it to this day. I was in a friend's car and I was talking to her in the back seat and her mom turns around and goes, Rowan, you do talk a lot, don't you? Like it was something that she had been like warned about by another parent or a teacher or like even my friend, her child. Um, so that has left a strong imprint on my psyche but also I don't think it really got raised as a red flag for my parents because our family has a very talkative slightly chaotic like interrupting each other style of communication um which to us is like oh we're listening we're engaged um which isn't every family's way of communicating and I think that potentially if I had talked as much as I did in another family it might have been flagged as unusual a lot quicker number three I lost uh, as a child pretty much anything I was ever given there were things that I was not allowed to have like I did not have a set of house keys as a child uh or even as a teenager I don't think because I would lose them and I think that was quite difficult because that can seem to people around you like you just are like careless or disrespectful and I really tried but I lost everything but on the other hand I ended up developing very specific color-coded systems of organization. Like I was a child and it's continued into adulthood that people considered to be so organized. Like look at all these color-coded folders. So yeah, balanced it out again. And number four, I always forgot to do my homework. I would get detentions. Pretty much the only thing I ever got detention for and I got it a lot was not doing homework. I would just forget that it existed. I would just completely not have a concept that it was a thing that was due, that it was a thing I was meant to be doing. But when I was a teenager, I figured out that if I basically ignored what the teachers told me to do in terms of like how I should write stuff in my planner so I'd remember to do it and did it my own way and figured out my own system of like reminding myself of it, that worked. And number five, um, I put off homework to the, the day it was due sometimes, uh, like earliest the night before it was due every single time. I didn't want to do that. Like I fully was like, I'm gonna just do the homework the day that it's set. I'm just gonna do it and like enjoy my life afterwards. Be free. Um, No, like I fully, there are pictures of me <laughs> as a teenager at like 1 a.m. on a train platform with my essay, like my folder and essay spread out around me after a gig because I like hadn't done the essay yet. But did any of my teachers know that I was doing that? No, of course they didn't. It got done in the end, as long as I remember the homework was due. So all of that is stuff that I didn't really clock at the time at all. This was something that came afterwards. So I have a few friends who have ADHD and I would like talk to them. And I was starting to get a sense that maybe this like image of the little boy running around screaming is not necessarily the picture of ADHD for everyone. And then when I would look up things like, you know, what are some ways to tell you have ADHD? It would say stuff that I really did not resonate with. So like, oh, you get up and walk around during meetings. And I'm like, sir, my anxiety could never. But then I had to stop myself and be like, ah, oh, yeah, my anxiety could never. What is the relationship between my anxiety, my like natural personality and 
whatever is going on with what I now know is ADHD. How are those things interlinking? And the more I thought about it, the more I was like, oh, a lot of the things that are discussing ADHD online are treating it as this separate pillar that doesn't intersect with any other kinds of experiences or disorders or mental health issues. Logically, if you are going to combine more than one thing, because, you know, people can have more than one of these things at the same time, it might manifest slightly differently. So this was just a, a little thought that was, you know, buzzing quietly in the back of my head. And then 2020 happened and we experienced lockdown and social isolation. Some stuff started to change and maybe make a lo little bit more sense. So for example, th that thing that I had thought was like completely not me and meant I couldn't possibly have ADHD, like, oh, getting up and walking around in the middle of class. Yeah, it turns out I wouldn't do that because of my anxiety. But when no one could see me, if I was on a Zoom meeting and cameras were off, I did not sit down once during any of those meetings. And it all started to come together. It's a joke amongst my friends that I am the spreadsheet friend. I have a spreadsheet for everything, for any holiday we go on, there will be multiple tabs, it will be color coordinated, like very much a spreadsheet person. And then I started to question, hey, am I a spreadsheet person or is this like a coping mechanism? Is this a way that I have figured out to deal with the fact that if I did not have these, I would not remember any information or retain any information that's in these spreadsheets. And I think that this is something that I've not really seen a lot of people talk about. When you're going through the process of figuring out if you have this thing, you suddenly have to deal with the idea of, is this trait me? Is it the ADHD? Or are those two things like not something you can separate? I also started to think about how other people saw me. So for example, I do not see myself as a driven person. I don't see myself as someone who is like restless or always needs to be busy. All of which are things that are ADHD symptoms on a lot of these lists. But then I was like looking at myself from the outside. Oh, I'm working a full-time job and then also doing YouTube as essentially another full-time job in the background plus running a creative retreat, plus this podcast thing, plus I'm doing this extra project. And it was like, mm, hmm, are we the best judge <laughs> of our own character? Hmm, next steps before I properly pursue this ADHD thing, I'm gonna chat with my parents. And very quickly, they came up with a lot of examples that I hadn't thought of or, you know, didn't remember. So the, uh, the evidence was building. It was getting more and more to the point where I was like, I should definitely be going to the doctor. And then the world of like online relatable ADHD content also was like trickling into my brain at this point. ADHD TikTok is something that I think is pretty, uh, like almost like a, a joke, an in-joke of the internet at this point. So I do think, and a lot of people have pointed out that this can be quite dangerous isn't the right word, but like a little bit iffy because it can feed into confirmation bias. And so I was like very conscious of this. When I decided that I wanted to go and try and get a diagnosis, it very much was with the idea of like, I'm not going to get an ADHD diagnosis. I'm going to figure out what all this stuff means. If it leads to ADHD, cool. If it doesn't, also cool. And I know that some people might be a little bit skeptical with the seeming like rise of people wanting to get checked for, for ADHD, wanting to like have an assessment. But I think that there's probably a lot of people who had a similar experience to me through lockdown where these layers of social conditioning start to wear away and who you kind of are underneath without those structures and stipulations starts to uncover itself. So the final step before I talk about like actually contacting the GP was like a little bit of prep work that I did before talking to them because I knew that if I just went unprepared, I would forget like everything that I was meant to be telling them and I would get it out of order and it would just be an absolute mess. I looked online and there are some like self-evaluation forms you can fill in. And I specifically did the forms before for looking at the way that you score the forms because I didn't want to affect the result, basically. Every one of those self-assessment forms was like, bitch, you're riddled with ADHD. I also, as you can probably predict by uh, things I have already said in this video, created a spreadsheet which had a list of every symptom or example that I could find online. And then I would pair it with examples from my own life, like s specific anecdotes, things that I could remember, stuff my parents had told me so that I could have evidence of each of them. And then also made a note of any that I didn't experience because there are a few things within ADHD, like symptoms that I just don't get at all. And I was like, 
like I think those are also important to talk about especially if it might change the diagnosis to something else so the very last thing I wanted to talk about in this section before we go on to the actual process of going to the doctors was a question that I got from Patreon which was did I consider any other diagnoses like specifically or any kind of interrelated diagnoses and this is something that was kind of playing a part in the entire process so far but I thought I would talk about it specifically and separately because I do think as well this probably fed into how long I went without getting diagnosed which is the fact that I am a woman and anyone who is a woman may well have experienced going to the doctors for something and basically being told pretty much for anything you go in there for either to lose weight or that you have anxiety and or depression. And so I got diagnosed with anxiety and depression when I was in my second year of uni. And it was very quick, like a diagnosis that honestly was like very quickly given. There wasn't really any exploration of other stuff. And then that was kind of it, sent on my way with some medication. So I took this medication and it completely got rid of my depression, but I was still having this feeling of anxiety. And I would tell anyone who would listen for so long about how I was like convinced that my anxiety was like very physiological. Cause I was like, I don't have any anxious thought like I'm worried about this or I'm anxious about this or particular scenarios that trigger the anxiety I just had the feeling of anxiety which if I was asked to describe it would be a restlessness a feeling of being powered by a motor uh some of you may have clocked literally it's hyperactivity I'm describing hyperactivity for god's sake so it turns out even though I did have this one particular diagnosis Everything that was also ADHD ended up getting shoved into the anxiety diagnosis at the same time. I would go back to the doctors and talk about my memory was getting way worse. And all of it was just put under like, it's the anxiety. And this is something that's been written about a lot. Women getting underdiagnosed with things like ADHD and also autism. So all that being said, if you are wondering if you have ADHD or something else, maybe try and get an assessment because honestly, that's going to be, that's going to be the way to tell is you just, you just find out if you have it. Okay. So how did I actually get this diagnosis? So at this point it's April and I go to my GPs and at the time, obviously because of COVID, it was a little bit weird because I didn't get to go in person. So a lot of people have asked me for advice on like, how do you bring it up with the doctor? Uh, I didn't have to, I had to bring it up with a form online where I just typed in, hey, I think I might have ADHD. Could I get an assessment? My advice though would be if you are at this point able to go into the doctors in person, be prepared, take some notes in with you, maybe take someone in like a friend or a family member to like advocate for you if you start getting stressed or forgetting things, because as I'm sure a lot of us know, there are some symptoms of ADHD, which maybe make needing to like advocate for yourself in, a, in an organized and measured way more difficult. So yeah, I would maybe just be prepared for that in, in case you need to talk to someone face to face and essentially like justify being forwarded on or being referred on to an actual assessor. So basically the GP was like, okay, I'm going to forward you on to what was essentially like a sort of mental health triage person. So it wasn't actually the assessor. It was like a sort of assessment gatekeeper, the person who you just had this like conversation with. And then they were like, oh yes, it seems like you should be sent on in the process or not, I guess. Like I assume at that point, there are some people that they don't forward on. So this assessment that I had like before actually being forwarded on to get assessed was awful. I cried during it. I hated the entire process. I did not take my own advice and did not have someone to advocate for me with me. I was like, yeah, I'll just do it on my own in my room. <laughs> that was a mistake. And this person was so dismissive because it was over the phone. I couldn't get a sense of that person's body language or like how they were feeling or like them be able to see me start to get upset as well. The big thing that upset me was they were basically like, why do you think you have it? And I was like, this is a very open-ended question. Okay, so here are the symptoms that, and they were like, I don't wanna hear the symptoms. I wanna hear why you think you have it. And I'm like, well, well, I can't really tell you why I think I have it without telling you the symptoms that I think I have. And so I basically had a cry, was very stressed and was just like, I don't know what you want from me. Like I'm trying, like, can I please just tell you what I've written down? I've come up with examples of how it is relevant to me, not just like a list, like please. And eventually this person let me continue and it was fine. I think they like realized how upset I was. Yeah, so it was not fun whatsoever. And then at the end, after an hour, I think on the phone to this person having this pre-assessment, they basically were like, okay, so I think I think we can get you referred to to see if you can see an assessor to to see if this is a diagnosis that makes sense. Um, oh, have you been told about the wait times? And I was like, uh, I mean, I've heard that the wait times are probably quite long. And she was like, yeah, so at the moment it's three to four years before you get to see an assessor to get a diagnosis probably could have told me that at the beginning of this and it might have saved us a lot of time and heartache. The NHS is extremely busy. 
extremely overworked, extremely underfunded. And uh, it takes a long time for someone who's an adult to get a ADHD diagnosis. There is a way that I haven't used, but I know some friends have used, which is trying to go around the system. And it's like Psychiatry UK, I think it's called. But because that cheat code has been told to so many people, that waitlist is now also multiple years long from the last I heard from people trying to use it. That essentially was the end of my experience with trying to get a diagnosis through the NHS. I was not willing to wait that long. I kind of made the decision that for me, it was worth spending some of my savings on getting a diagnosis privately that I knew was going to be a lot quicker because I just really felt like I needed some clarity on it. So if you are interested in going for the NHS route, just know it is going to be an extremely long wait and you might feel like you're able to wait, but yes, that is something to be warned about. So between me first contacting the GP and then getting contacted by this initial assessor, that was a few months. And then on that day that I hung up the phone with the news, it was going to be like a few years before I could get a diagnosis. I immediately emailed a private doctor. So I had asked online and done some research into people who were recommended that other people had gone to who they had had like really good experiences with. This particular doctor had been recommended by a couple of people. So I emailed him and then literally the next day he messaged me back and was like, hey, I have some appointments in a few months time. I might be able to fit you in. Can you fill in this form before our kind of big assessment? Send the form over to me beforehand and I'll go through it. And then I'll use that to kind of guide the assessment. So the form I had to fill in was called the DIVA form, which stands for, let me just look this up, Diagnostic Interview for ADHD in Adults. It's like a 20 page form that's very dense. Um, they really made someone with ADHD fill in this long ass form. Very rude. And I obviously procrastinate until the very last minute and send it to him like way too close to the, the actual assessment deadline. But you know, I got it done in the end and that's, uh, that's all that matters. So basically, if you're asked to fill in this form, what to expect is a list of like symptoms and ways that it might present. And it's normally like a checklist for how it might present in adulthood and a checklist for how it might present in childhood. And then it will encourage you to like talk to your parents and things like that, uh, people who knew you when you were younger and kind of tick all of the ones that applied, make some notes, all that kind of jazz. So I'll give you a couple of examples of like stuff that they ask. So one of the questions, do you often fail to give close attention to detail or do you make careless mistakes in your work or during other activities? Do you often avoid or do you have an aversion to or are you unwilling to do tasks which require sustained mental effort? And then are you often forgetful during daily activities? And one of the things that I found a little bit different to some of the other sort of self-diagnosis stuff I'd done was that it also gave examples of those kind of coping mechanisms so for example um like do you have a rigid use of list to make sure things aren't forgotten and i found that kind of stuff really encouraging i was filling this in and i was like oh okay this seems this seems like it's going in a good direction so at the end of august i have this remote assessment this section i'm going to tell you like what happened what the experience was like what kind of stuff you can expect so the assessment was not like in the doctor's office although i imagine that normally it would be but because of lockdowns and things like that it was remote so we did it over zoom cameras on mics on and it was great it was so good the doctor i had was so understanding patient kind immediately put you in a position of feeling relaxed so the assessment basically kind of went chronologically from childhood all the way up to now in terms of like experiences and stuff that i thought might be linked to adhd he clearly had like a list of questions he was asking that i imagine he asked everyone but he was also like really responsive to what i was saying specifically we kind of just talked it through and occasionally he would bring up stuff where he's like it was surprising to me that you'd written this down or this makes a lot of sense. I've seen this particular thing before in this scenario, or like how far would you say this is something that's affected you the most out of these symptoms? Cause you seem to have ticked a lot of boxes for it. Really trying to understand and, and treat me like an individual. Other assessments that I know people have done for ADHD might involve specifically like coming in with a parent or a guardian or someone who knew you as a child. I know people who have been asked to like bring in school reports. So basically the idea is like taking as many sources as possible to kind of see a full rounded picture of, of what's going on. One of the things I think that made this assessment and this assessor particularly good is that he himself has ADHD. And I got quite lucky, I think, in that my ADHD presented itself like very similarly to his. And so that assessment lasted for a couple of hours, I think. And then he basically was like, cool, I will write up a report and I will send it to you. And I will also send it to your GP. And that report would have summary of everything we talked about. And then also his diagnosis, if he chose to give one, if he thought that he could give one, and then also recommendations for medication or treatment going on. So we've reached the part of the video where I talk about my experiences with medication. There are a number of different types of medication you can be given for ADHD. And we decided to start 
start on a particular medication basically just because it was the same medication that he was on and our symptoms presented so similarly he was like this has worked really well for me. Let's give this a try first and see how we go. So one of the things that is really important to know here is if you go and get an assessment privately, it seems like you should be able to just go straight to the NHS for treatment. And so that would mean, for example, like your prescriptions would be the standard cost of NHS prescriptions and like capped at that low amount and that they would take care of it. That is not the case. Because the medication for ADHD is like restricted, I think it's like called an amber medication, something like that. It basically means that the GPs or the pharmacists are not qualified to assess how you're doing on the medication. You need to have like a professional qualified person to do that. So that was the doctor who diagnosed me. So for the first three months of the medication, I had to essentially be prescribed it privately, which meant that I also paid private drug costs for it. My first prescription costs 45 pounds. And this new one that I've just been put on because I will talk about this in a second, but I've had a dose increase that went up to 65. But I do know someone who has prescribed a different medication and that month's first month supply costs over a hundred pounds. Hypothetically, if you do not get on with the medication and you have to start a new medication, you would have to keep paying for that expertise until you'd settled into a medication that made sense for you to just like have on a repeat prescription. Also obviously useful to look at the side effects, possible side effects of these medications. So I am on the medication that is like known as Ritalin in the US or I think it's called Concerta XL in the UK. They obviously will have different brand names, but the side effects are essentially a lot of stuff that I already have for other medical reasons. So like increased sweating. Um, I have hyperhidrosis, so I sweat constantly. Headaches. Again, I have chronic headaches. So it was just hilariously a lot of stuff I already have. So I don't think I had any side effects, but um, who knows? Maybe the headaches I was having were not my normal ones, but side effects from the medication. What's interesting about the particular drug that I take is that it starts working pretty much immediately on your first dose, like an hour after your first dose. Taking that medication, the experience of it, it wasn't like some kind of incredible shift. My brain goes into laser focus mode. Like it, it wasn't that. The way that the drug works is that it slow releases over about 12 hours, but it was this really profound change when I thought about tasks that previously there had been a little thing in the back of my mind that was like, Mm, are you procrastinating? Are you not doing these tasks because there is something in your brain that's actually making it difficult? Or are you just lazy? Like, are you just lazy? When you're sat here and you should be doing a task and you cannot make yourself do the task. Why is that Rowan? And this medication uh, very much showed me that there is a difference between I don't want to do the task and I literally physically and mentally cannot make myself do the task. If it was a boring task, I'd still not want to do it, but I could do it. Like I could just decide to to get up and do it, which was not something I was capable of before. And I also asked my dad, do I seem different? And that first week he was like, yeah, me and your mom have been talking about it. You really do. So I've been taking those for like just over a month now. And I slowly started to see it, the effectiveness slightly drop off. And this was something that I'd seen from a lot of people and actually something that really made me happy for this whole, like the doctor stays on you, like you can communicate with them. And I think if I hadn't have had that kind of communication, I might've thought like, oh yeah, maybe it was just like placebo effect at the beginning, it's not working anymore. And I can see a lot of people being like, mm, do I really wanna pay for another prescription? I think I'll just leave it, it clearly wasn't working. But after talking to him, he was like, oh, so um, you might just need a higher dosage. Oftentimes, if you don't have a high enough dose, it will work at first, stop working. Once you get to the, the dose that does work, it will just be steady. So this next section is about dealing with ADHD. So obviously I am not a doctor, I'm not a trained professional. Uh, I'm just someone who is riddled with ADHD itself. I can just give you some tips and tricks, ideas that I've come across that I've had recommended to me that I've found that work. Obviously, as I said before, one of the things that's worked really well is medication, but I am fully aware that there's a lot of people who either it doesn't work for them, they can't take it because of like allergies or something like that. Or maybe you're still waiting in like the years long list, the kind of waiting list for a diagnosis. One of the things that's been really useful for me, which obviously is not available to everyone, is um, now that I've gone freelance, being able to work and do stuff in the hours that works for me has been incredibly useful. For, trying to pay attention not to like how long people say you should be able to concentrate for right you've got things like the pomodoro technique where it's like oh like concentrate for 25 minutes or 50 minutes what i do is like i'll start to do a task like i don't know scripting a, a video 
uh, and I'll put a timer on and I will go for as long as I can naturally before my mind drifts. And then I stop the timer and see how long that was. And that can be hugely variable. Sometimes that's like 10 minutes and sometimes it's like two hours. But then I take a break that's like a percentage of whatever that was, right? So if I only work for like 10 minutes, maybe I'm like, okay, I'm gonna take a quick two minute break, like get a walk around and then try again. If it's two hours, it's like, okay, I'm gonna reward myself by being able to watch an episode of like a sitcom or something like that, that I wanna to watch to relax. Trying to go with your own natural rhythms and like not punish yourself for, or feel bad for like, oh, I only managed to focus for 10 minutes. Try and weave in your own capabilities with the techniques people have come up with. If you have ADHD, even if you haven't been diagnosed, it may be that this stuff is really useful for you anyway. You know, you don't have to wait till you get a diagnosis to start to like give yourself permission to try and use any of these shortcuts or hacks or things like that. I will also say that I have been using an Alexa, which has been really useful for like setting reminders for stuff. If I'm, for example, like cooking a meal, this thing needs to be taken out after five minutes and then I need to put this thing on in 10 minutes. I don't have to hold that information in my head. I can just set all the reminders on Alexa and it can just tell me. That's been, it's been super, super useful. Also, you can add stuff to a shopping list or your to-do list as and when you're just walking around. You don't have to like stop what you're doing, go to your phone, type it in or like change your tabs. So I found that really useful because I don't get distracted by suddenly having to go into my shopping list tab on my computer and then I forget what tab I was in before, what work was I doing? So yeah, just li little things like that have been super useful. I also got asked in this section what people could do to help or support partners with ADHD or like I guess friends with ADHD maybe. Communication, genuine, honest, open communication and respect will take you a long way. Stuff that they might need that you might be able to provide, but also stuff that's going on with the ADHD that might be affecting you. Ways to compromise, ways to make it work for everyone, I think is really important. And one of the things that I saw online that I thought was a genius idea is like, instead of splitting chores 50-50 in the way you might traditionally think of, so like you do the hoovering, I do the dusting. Because a lot of the time people with ADHD will start tasks and then lose interest about halfway through. The person with ADHD just starts all the tasks does half of the task and then the other person finishes the task or vice versa. That's such a simple thing. And like, it's still the same amount of work, but it's just split in a way that's like unusual to how you're supposed to do stuff. But in the end, it's it will work better. Finding unique solutions that work for you and your life and your friendship or your relationship, I think makes a lot of sense. And finally, do I regret getting diagnosed? This is a question I got quite a lot actually. And I was sort of surprised because I was like, no, should I? have a couple of other people kind of also were saying like does it really make a difference if i can just do all of these tips and tricks and things i help you deal with adhd like do i really need a diagnosis to tell me i have it that is very much fair enough and as i said like any kind of advice that people give around like how to deal with adhd you can take regardless of whether you even have it or not however i will say that like without a diagnosis i would not have been able to get medication and that has been extremely useful. I also think that having this confirmation has helped like really recontextualize stuff about myself that I was maybe insecure about or I felt like were flaws. Even though I know in like within my brain, I'm like, I am not doing this on purpose. Like I am actually actively trying to not do this thing that I know is making people frustrated or making people feel like I don't respect them or appreciate them or anything like that. Also, obviously that like access to work grant that I just talked about, like you need to have a diagnosis to be able to access that. So it's definitely worth looking up once you get diagnosed, like what happens then? It's the start of like another journey. So I think that that answers all the questions. Those were just my experiences. But if you have had a different experience or have something that you think I didn't cover or or something that's like specific to where you live that you think other people might find useful, then obviously please, please put it in the comments. If you'd like to help support this channel and me in living a ADHD friendly, like freelancing life, then a link to my Patreon is gonna be in the description. Or you could check out today's sponsor, Fabulous, which is the number one self-care app, which helps you build better habits and achieve your goals using behavioral science-backed research. You can use the app to build your ideal daily routine with the link below. So one of the things I really appreciate about this app is that it's a very like slow and steady wins the race type vibe instead of being like shaming people for not immediately picking up on like the 12 step perfect routine that it's designed for you it's like hey let's just take this one habit at a time yeah like let's actually build this step by step so it's much more sustainable in the long run very much encourages you to go at your own pace with this very like gentle supportive vibe including things like accountability challenges with other members you can also utilize these built-in reminders so that you don't just forget the app exists when it's not like right in front of you um which is something that my ADHD brain does. 
a lot. Fabulous has a free to use option, but with a premium membership, you get all the content unlocked, including being able to add an unlimited number of habits to your routines, daily coaching sessions, and all pre-designed habit journeys and exercises. And you're able to restore and back up your progress. So after I filled in my quiz and like started to explore the different options, I was very appreciative of the fact that it wasn't just like, here's a one size fits all morning routine. It very much was like, some people want to be like more relaxed. Some people want to get more sleep. Some people want to be focused and productive. Like let's actually look at what you want and figure out the best steps to get you there. As I mentioned before, the first 100 people to click on the link will get 25% off a premium fabulous subscription. So uh, yeah, if it seems like it might be useful for you, check it out.